ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهد الله فهو المهتد ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا واشهد ان لا اله الا الله واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارham ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما verily thanksgiving and praise are due to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone i offer him gratitude and praise and we beg his aid and we seek asylum with him against our misdeeds and the wrongs committed by us whoever allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides and he only guides those who really seek his guidance no one can misguide and whoever allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows to go astray and he only allows those to go astray who do not want to be guided no one can guide i bear witness that there is no deity worthy of worship except allah and i bear witness that muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is his servant and messenger allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in his glorious book in the ayahs that i recited from al quran al karim oh you who believe fear allah be conscious of allah as he should be feared and die not except in a state of islam oh mankind reverence your guardian lord who created you from a single person and created of like nature his mate and from the two of them created countless men and women reverence allah through whom you demand your mutual rights and reverence the wombs that bore you for allah ever watches over you O oh, you who believe fear Allah and always say a word directed to the right that he may make your conduct whole and sound and forgive you your sins whoever obeys Allah and his messenger has already attained the highest achievement My dear brothers and sisters in Islam just a brief reminder for myself and for you when we speak about forgiveness it is usually a very difficult topic It is hard to forgive when someone has taken advantage of you has wronged you it is hard to forgive when someone that you trust someone that you have put trust in someone that is beloved to you or a family member to forgive and to let things go so i want to spend just a few minutes on forming our understanding of forgiveness as believers you know we often hear so much about how praiseworthy it is to forgive and to let grudges go and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in his glorious book wal ya'fu wal yasfahu ala tuhibbuna an yaghfir allah lakum wallahu ghafurur rahim allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says let them forgive and overlook and pardon Do you not want that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should forgive you your sins seeing that Allah is much forgiving a dispenser of grace So the principle that we as believers live by is that we treat others as we want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to treat us If you want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive you then you forgive and that should be enough by itself that we want the forgiveness of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that should be enough of a motivation even if the one that we are forgiving in our eyes maybe they're not even deserving of forgiveness because we want that higher forgiveness from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because we want the mercy of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so we show that mercy So what does forgiveness entail? And how do we deal when it comes to forgiving people? 
You know, when we talk about a person's sins, there are sins that are between the person and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in that case, the door of forgiveness is always open. The door to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always open. It never closes. Meaning, if, sin, if the sin only involves me or you harming ourselves, then it is between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is between you and I and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the opportunity of tawbah, of forgiveness, are limitless. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in His glorious book, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَصْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَتُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ جَمِيعًا إِنَّهُ هُوَ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ وَأَنِيبُوا إِلَىٰ رَبِّكُمْ وَأَسْلِمُوا لَهُ مِنْ قَبْلِ أَنْ يَأْتِيَكُمُ الْعَذَابُ ثُمَّ لَا تُنْصَرُونَ Say, O oh my servants who have transgressed against themselves by sinning, do not despair of the mercy of Allah. Indeed, Allah forgives all sins. Indeed, it is He who is forgiving the merciful. And return in repentance to your Lord and submit to Him before the punishment comes upon you. Then you will not be helped. A man comes to the Prophet ﷺ and says, If I drink alcohol, Will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive me? And the Prophet ﷺ said, if your repentance is sincere, then yes. The man then says, what if I am weak and I fall back into that sin? And the Prophet ﷺ said, well, then a sin will be written for you. Then he says, what if I regret and I go back and seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness? And the Prophet ﷺ said, well, if your repentance is sincere and you try your best not to return to the sin, then Allah will forgive you. And this happens, according to some narration, about eight times. So this person keeps going back. And the Prophet ﷺ says that Allah will forgive you. And he went on to say, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not tire from forgiving you until you tire from seeking His forgiveness. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not tire from forgiving you until you tire from seeking His forgiveness. Meaning that if it's between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you keep falling into the sin and you keep asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't say, you know, it's been five times or it's been six times. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't say that. Now we should try to make sure that we don't fall into the same sins eight times or nine times. We should try to put the effort, the resolve, in making sure that we don't fall into that. But the issue is some of us are very weak. Some of us human beings, we're very weak. So we fall into these traps over and over. So if the sin is between you and Allah, it is one thing. But what happens when the sin is between you that involves other people. What happens when that sin involves other people? And that's where it gets trickier. That's where it gets very dangerous. That's where it gets very dangerous because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not remove the rights of people just because He forgives you. Just because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives you he is not going to wrong that person by doing another injustice to him. So if that person chooses not to forgive you, then you have to go and seek their forgiveness. You have to go and give them the right back. You have to go and beg them. Whatever you've done, whether you've taken advantage of them, whether you've stolen from them, whether you've harmed them, you have to go and ask for their pardon. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to forgive you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may forgive you, but that person may not. And you have to seek that person's forgiveness before you reach the time of the akhirah. And we'll look at a couple incidents just to kind of form, brothers, 
If you can move forward a little bit, there are some brothers who are waiting. Just a little bit if you can move forward. So, we'll look at the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ just to form a perspective on how he dealt with some of the situations. You know, it's one thing to forgive, and forgiveness is something that we as believers have to do. But do you have to give people chances and chances and chances over and over again? One of the incidents happened as the Prophet ﷺ was preparing for the conquest of Mecca. And as they were preparing, Hatib ibn Abu Balta, he was a companion of the Prophet ﷺ, a Sahaba. And he wrote a letter. He wrote a letter, he gave it to a woman to inform the Quraysh of the plan of the Prophet ﷺ. So here the Muslim army, the Prophet ﷺ is preparing them to conquer Mecca. And a companion, he writes a letter, and he sends it with this woman. And the Prophet ﷺ receives revelation that this has happened. So he gathers Ali and Zubair radiallahu anhu, and sends them after this woman. So they find the woman, and they ask her for the letter, and she refused. They searched some of her belongings. She still refused. And then finally... They told her, look, if you don't give us the letter, then we're going to have to search you. And she found out the seriousness of this matter. So she gave them, she reached into her garment, she gave them the letter. And when Ali radiallahu anhu and Zubair, they brought the letter back, the Prophet ﷺ was sitting with his companions. And in that company was also Hatib. But he did not know that the Prophet ﷺ had found out about the letter. And so the Prophet ﷺ had someone read the letter. And when the Sahaba, they heard the letter, they looked at the Prophet ﷺ and they said, O oh Rasulullah, he has betrayed Allah. He has betrayed the Messenger. And he has betrayed the believers. So let's ex execute him. This is treason. You know, the guy has put us in a lot of danger. If the Quraysh would have found out about the letter, we would have been in grave danger. And the Prophet ﷺ, he looked at Al-Hatib and said, Ya Hatib, why would you do this? You are a believer. Why would you do such a thing, Ya Hatib? And in his own defense, Hatib said, O oh, Rasulullah, by Allah, I swear that I am still a believer in Allah and in his Rasul. My Iman has not changed one bit. But I am a man here in the Muslim camp that has no relationship, has no tribe. And in Mecca, I have my family, my children, my wife, my belongings, and we have no one to protect us. So basically, to, to get some protection from the Quraysh, he felt that this was something that, if things went wrong with the conquest, that maybe his family would be protected. But obviously, the Sahaba, they didn't want to buy it, and they were shocked. Because the Prophet ﷺ, he forgave them. He forgave him. He looked at him and he told the Sahaba, he said he told the truth. And so he forgave them. And the Sahaba, they still wanted him to be punished. And then the Prophet ﷺ, he looked at Omar and he said, Isn't Hatib one of those who fought alongside us in the battle of Badr? And he continued to say, Don't you know? But maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looked at the people of Badr, the veterans of Badr, and said to them, "Whatever you Do whatever you want. I have forgiven you for everything. This man belongs to the veterans of Badr. He is not some hypocrite who just showed up and gave excuses. There is no way a hypocrite would be at Badr. So Omar began to cry and then he said, Allah and his messenger know best. So in this situation, the Prophet ﷺ forgives him. In another incident, a man who fought the Muslims in the battle of Badr, his name is Abu Ghura. He was captured as a prisoner. And he's standing in front of the Prophet ﷺ. And he tells the Prophet ﷺ, I will not fight you after this. I was forced to come and fight. But after this, I will never come and fight you. And the Prophet ﷺ said, do you promise? He said, yes, I promise. So he lets him go. And then the same individual is captured again in the battle of Uhud. 
and he comes again and pleads to the Prophet Sallallahu and he says, O oh, Prophet of Allah, I will not fight the Muslims again. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he looked at him and he said, a believer does not allow himself to be stung in the same hole twice. So Abu Ghura was executed this time. These two incidents are very interesting. The first man he lets go, and the second one he lets go the first time. But the second time the Prophet ﷺ, he sets an example, and he sets a methodology. A believer does not allow himself to be stung in the same hole twice. Meaning being merciful is different from being naive. Do not expose yourself, yourself to be taken advantage of. This is not how a believer is supposed to function. The Prophet Sallallahu mercy did not limit himself to put everyone else at risk. Because if he would have let him go the second time, he would have probably been there in Khandaq and he would have probably came for another battle. But because this became a behavior and he saw this behavior, that is what he dealt with accordingly. So how do we you know, bring these examples to our situation and learn some lessons from it that may apply in our situation, in our condition. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulullah, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad, kama sallayta ala Ibrahima wa ala ali Ibrahima, inna ka hamid al-majid. Allahumma barik ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad, kama barikta ala Ibrahima wa ala ali Ibrahima, inna ka hamid al-majid. There's a saying of Isa alayhi salam, if it is associated with him in the Bible, he said, be shrewd as snakes, but innocent as doves, meaning a person has to be smart, but a person should not be evil as they have been taken advantage of by evil. So if I'm in a relationship and I've been abused by extending forgiveness, that's one thing. And I let it go. I don't hold any grudges. And that's how we should be as believers. We forgive, we let things go, and we don't hold grudges. But it's another thing to keep on giving chances after chances after chances. And putting yourself at risk, and then also putting someone else at risk as well. Forgiveness is a given. Is a given. A believer should always cleanse their heart and forgive in order to spiritually cleanse yourself. Because if you're always having grudges and you have hatred towards people, spiritually you're going to be very weak. It's going to pull you down. So you forgive and you don't hold grudges. And you ask yourself the following question. When giving people, you know, chances, are you putting your rest, yourself at risk? Are you putting yourself at risk? And the Prophet ﷺ said, The believer does not harm, nor does he reciprocate harm. You should not be naive and put yourself at risk for a second time. And the other thing is, are you putting others at risk? You're, are you putting others at risk? You know, for example, if there's a crooked person in our community, and you have a business dealing with him, and he rips you off. He takes advantage of you. And then you see him doing the same thing with others. Yes, you have forgiven him. You should not hold grudges against him. You move on. But you can't allow that person to harm others. You cannot allow that person to take advantage of others when you know that. Now, you don't come here on a mic and start shouting, you know, don't do business with this person. You do it in a, with wisdom. But you have to warn. And the Prophet ﷺ did warn people about those who took advantage of others, those who would harm others. You know, in, a, in one incident, in one example, a woman came to the Prophet ﷺ and he asked about two, two men interested in marrying. And the Prophet ﷺ, he said to her, this man always carries a stick on his shoulder and the other guy is stingy. You know, so the Prophet ﷺ wasn't like, you know, these brothers, maybe this is their only opportunity to get married. So I shouldn't say anything. No. Yes, he cared about these brothers, but at the same time, that's his, sis that's his sister as well. You have to care for her too. So I might forgive a person, but at the same time, 
we have a responsibility to protect others. And too often, we place too much on the aggrieved, too much pressure on those who are oppressed. Instead of the solving, instead of solving the problems of oppression or those who are taking advantage of us in our communities, and this is not the Sunnah of the Prophet. This is not the Sunnah of our beloved Prophet. We don't allow these, these you know, ills to continue to grow in our communities. We have to be smart for ourselves. We have to be smart for our families. We have to be smart for our communities, for our children. And we have to make sure that we do something about these ills. That when we see these ills in our community, for the sake of our children, we have to make sure that we do something about it. That it doesn't continue to grow and become even worse of a problem. So we don't allow, as Muslims, we don't allow ourselves to be taken advantage of or be oppressed, and we don't allow, allow others to be taken advantage of and be oppressed. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He never allowed our hearts to be filled with grudges and hate. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to remove the grudges and hatred from our hearts. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us and our family and our community from being taken advantage of and being oppressed. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from oppressing and taking advantage of others. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala use us to protect those who are being oppressed and taken advantage of. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make the difficult situation for the ummah better. Just today, this morning, you know, in Egypt, about 180 people died in an explosion. Last week, I think in Nigeria, there was 50 people who were killed. And in Afghanistan, there was about the same number last week. So again, the situation doesn't get better, you know, but we have to do what we can. You know, if that means we start from ourselves, making ourselves better, making our families better, making our communities better, then inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will find a way out for, from this difficulty. This is not going to last forever. As long as we are sincere and we build a strong relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, these difficulties are not going to go on forever. We will come out of it, but the only way we come out of it is working together and trusting in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahumma khfiri lil muslimina wal muslimat wal mu'minina wal mu'minat al ahya'u minhum wal amwat rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fi al-akhirati hasana wa qina adhab al-nar سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين وأقيم الصلاة.